Hi everyone, Jake here from Fulfill. Today I'm very excited to be joined by the General Manager of Marketing and Fundraising at the RSPCA New Zealand, Dominique Leeming. Dominique has over 20 years fundraising experience and was also awarded as the Fundraising Institute of New Zealand's Fundraising Leader of the Year Award winner and the Supreme Fundraising Excellence Award winner for 2019. With that, she was also inducted as a Fundraising Institute of New Zealand Fellow. Dominique, welcome. Thanks, Jake. It's good to be here. Oh, it's so great to have you on. And I just said it before, but I'll repeat it. This is the uh, first New Zealander I've had on. And as a New Zealander, it's uh, refreshing to uh, finally talk with someone doing fundraising in New Zealand. But to get started, tell us about the beginning of your fundraising career. What were some key lessons you learned in those early years? Okay, so my first paid fundraising job, I walked into when the organization had just mailed the entire deceased list on the database. So that was an interesting start. <laughs> Thankfully, I wasn't part of that. So I came in after that. But really, I guess I started fundraising um, as a teenager. My dad was really uh, community minded and introduced me to civil society and that kind of thing. So I was involved with organizations when I was young and, you know, on the committee for this local surf life saving club. And I was a um, Cub Scout leader as a teenager and all of that kind of good stuff. So always involved with real grassroots fundraising activities. And then as a young parent, I was a parent in my early twenties and um, I got involved with Plunkett and then had leadership role in the local branch at Plunkett. So, you know, we were putting on things like fashion parades with all the mothers involved and all of that good stuff. So um, really enjoyed all of that. And, and that is what led me into a, a professional career in fundraising. Um, and I was thinking about the, the lessons. And I think when you're doing that type of activity, particularly as a volunteer, the most important thing is to have fun, <laughs> you know, and you build lifelong friendships through some of those, you know, the effort that goes into organizing a fundraising event you you're working really closely with people and you know these friendships can go on for the rest of your life which is absolutely wonderful but i guess um in terms of my professional career because it's quite a different type of fundraising now the two key things that i think i i learned early on were the importance and the value of the database and having really good data in there that that's your most valuable tool that you have as a fundraiser and the second one was about donor care and really looking after those people so that they have a lifelong relationship with your organization i think those were the critical critical early learnings yeah, great start. And uh, yeah, you've achieved so many great things since and I'm looking forward to going into a few of those key areas as the interview goes on. But when you look back again at your early years in fundraising, what stands out as one of your most successful campaigns to be part of and why was it so successful? Um, I Because you having sent me the, the questions you were going to ask me beforehand, I thought about this one in particular and it's actually not quite from my early years, it's more from my middle years, but it's a uh, a campaign that is still so close to my heart that it's the one I have to share with you for this. So um, prior to working for SPCA New Zealand, I worked for Coast Guard New Zealand. And I started out there in a part-time role for Coast Guard Southern Region. And then I got involved with Coast Guard Central Region. And then I ended up with the Coast Guard New Zealand role. And I helped um, do the fundraising campaigns for their capital projects, so big boat builds and um, buildings. And um, there was one in particular, and that was for Coast Guard Bluff. And if anybody's watching this who's not from New Zealand, you'll need to know where Bluff is. <laughs> so Bluff is a tiny little fishing village at the bottom of the South Island of New Zealand, and it sits on the edge of a really dangerous piece of water, which is Fobo Strait, which is between the South Island and Stewart Island. And Coast Guard Bluff had for many years been um, using a boat that wasn't really fit for purpose for the type of seas that they were operating on. And so they decided that they would run a fundraising campaign for a new vessel. Um, and a lot of the impetus for this had come from because the year before there had been the second most, uh, the second most significant maritime disaster down on Fobo Strait since the Wahimi went down in Wellington. And that was the sinking of the fishing boat Easy Rider. Um, and eight people lost their lives uh, on that boat, including a seven-year-old boy. But one person survived. And it was the most extraordinary story. So I had this really ridiculously amazing story. And the person who survived was Dallas Reedy. 
and I'm going to use his words because he um, he described how it was as he was sitting on the deck of the boat in the middle of the night and he heard this rogue wave coming towards the fishing boat. And he said, I was sitting on the deck and I heard it like a wind rushing, like a train, but I heard it. And this wave came along and flipped over the boat. So he was the only one outside. He managed to scramble up onto the upturned hull of the boat and he was knocking on it, trying to see if any of the people who were sleeping down below had survived. He never heard anything. So he was stuck out there in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the night, on this boat and two hours later it sank. And so there he was floating in the middle of Fovo Strait. And he found an empty plastic um, petrol container and he tied it round his neck and called it Wilson. You know, he was doing the whole <laughs> Tom Hanks thing. Um, and he talked to this empty petrol tank and he, one of the key reasons why he tied it around his neck was because he knew about the sea and what happens to bodies in the sea and the sea lice, um, the damage that they do. And so he sort of thought there was a very good chance that he would die. And he wanted his mother and his wife to be able to identify him and, you know, be able to see his face. So that, yeah, that was pretty, pretty wrenching. But anyway, he was floating along in the sea for 18 hours and it was a young Coast Guard volunteer who spotted him and his name's Rhys Ferguson. And um, you know, I've got this most extraordinary photograph that the Southland Times took of the moment that Rhys and Dallas met after Dallas was released from hospital. And it shows Rhys from behind and Dallas's face is looking at the camera as he's hugging Rhys. And you can just see this amazing, gratitude and joy on his face as he's thanking this person who spotted him in the sea and I just knew I had to use that for our fundraising story but we had to be really really sensitive about it because so many people had lost their lives but there were other good visual aids and visual aids are so useful in fundraising the Southland Times had taken an extraordinary photograph while the search was on and what every fisherman and every fishing boat that can possibly help gets involved in a, in a rescue like that. So we had this photograph taken from the air of a whole lot of fishing boats all lined up doing a grid, what's called a grid search. And they're quite big fishing boats. And then there was this tiny little Coast Guard rescue vessel in the midst of them. And it was like, I couldn't have hoped for anything to more clearly articulate We've got a bunch of volunteers going out on that tiny little boat in those treacherous waters, and they're risking their lives every time they go out and do that, um, you know, and please help us get them some better equipment was basically the case. So um, we just, I, I, I did a fundraising feasibility study first up and um, met with all sorts of leaders in the Southland community. Um, and Southland's two degrees of separation, so everybody knew everybody else. Um, and I just met with extraordinary support um, wherever I went. So I met with the then editor of the Southland Times newspaper, Fred Tullett. And one of the first things he said to me in the meeting was, I can help you raise the money you need for this project, you know. And he went on to do extraordinary things. So when we'd got 50% of the funds raised and we were ready to start launching the public phase of the campaign. He gave me the whole front page of the Southland Times on a Saturday in December to put our whole case for support out and a mechanism for people to give. <laughs> and so people just started pouring donations in. Unfortunately, technology back then didn't allow me to capture all the details. I didn't have a system in place that could do it. So then I was manually trying to track down these people who were making donations, <laughs> which was just very time consuming, but so worthwhile because I'd track them down and I'd have these phone conversations with people, you know, and I remember this, this man who told me that his son-in-law goes out fishing a lot. So this was, you know, a donation because he wanted to keep his son-in-law safe so that he would come home to the grandchildren and his wife. And I remember talking to one older lady who lived in Bluff and um, I think she'd lived there for something like 15 to 20 years. 
and but Bluffs are very parochial communities. So she she told me that she was feeling like she was nearly a local. Um, but every morning she would watch the fishermen go out to sea and she loved her blue cod and her oysters. And so she felt, she felt they risked their lives every time they went out to do this fishing and bring back these wonderful products for her. So she donated all of her tax rebate that year. And, you know, and I just had these lovely, lovely engagements with people. And one of the most special ones was there was, there was a, a regular donation going in every week and it was a Reedy and you know, Dallas Reedy was the person we'd rescued and it was like, that must be one of Dallas's relatives. And it took me ages and ages to track down contact information, but it turned out it was his mum and um, went down and met her and had the most extraordinary meeting with her where we were all laughing and in tears and she was describing the whole time while he was lost at sea and what that was like for her and then when she heard the news that he'd been found and she went running from the house and you know she only had one shoe on and she she can't remember but she knows somebody came along and picked her up and drove her to the hospital and just what an extraordinary moment that was for her so for me i guess there were really important critical lessons to this one and it was to have a really compelling case for support for, for the campaign to have really effective leadership and i i'll never forget recruiting the chair of the volunteer fundraising campaign for that that one and his name is john turnbull and i had an initial meeting with him and he said yes he would be happy to be involved with the fundraising and yes he would have, be happy to be the chair and um so I had that meeting with him on a Thursday. By Monday of the following week, he'd started to form the committee. He'd set the first fundraising committee meeting for that Wednesday and the Thursday morning following. I had the minutes of that meeting. I mean, you know, we were in different cities. It was, it was extraordinary. So that effective leadership who absolutely insist that they're going to succeed, you know, that there was, if not succeeding is not an option, kind of people like that. Um, a well thought out plan is necessary. You need to know that those funds are available in the community. And I guess one of the advantages with Southland is the whole community recognised the need for that particular project, you know, and, and most people knew or knew of somebody who'd been impacted by a tragedy on Fovo Strait. You need an organisation with a, a good reputation and you need, you know, the organisation's management and board behind you. And we had all of that. So really i think that's that's why that one worked so well <laughs> wow that's an incredible story thanks for sharing that i mean that's why i mean you do your job right that that's that's incredibly impactful and moving and, and i'm sure that's just continued on as today you are the general manager of marketing and fundraising for the spca new zealand what does your role entail so uh, I, I'm a fundraiser at heart, but I look after communications and marketing as well for SPCA. And, um, you know, anybody who has ever worked for an animal charity will know that we're really fortunate that puppies and kittens, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's easy to get a lot of attention for puppies and kittens. So we get heaps of free media. We um, have an extraordinary level where we're running over averaging over two stories a day in, in the earned media space. So that's a really busy component um, of our organization. And we've probably, we've been light on marketing in recent years um, with more of a focus on fundraising and comms, but we probably need to ramp that up as we're, we've just launched, uh, relaunched um, SPCA certified, which used to be SPCA blue tick. So it's an endorsement on certain food products. Um, so we need to do some more activity in some of those spaces as well. But I, I look after all of all of those things. Um, but yeah, I, I think I've answered this later as well. But I think one of the most critical and important things for me in my role to be successful is to hire really good people who have the knowledge and skills in those other areas where I'm not as strong. And even in fundraising, and you know, I've been fundraising for years. My fundraising manager and her team know way more about fundraising than I do. <laughs> so, yeah, I find that hard yeah. to believe, but that's interesting. Very interesting. Um, 
Yeah, and we will go into that again because we um, you put a strong emphasis on building a strong team, which I think is very important to go through. But um, yeah. you started with the SPCA in 2016, and how has fundraising changed in the organisation over those years? So everything has changed since I started, and it's been the wildest um, career ride of my life with SPCA. So I started then as the fundraising manager for SPCA Canterbury, and I've been approached by the CEO, the then CEO, and I knew that SPCA was looking at going through a change process and coming together as one, because at that stage, SPCA was 46 separately incorporated societies. And people generally didn't know that, you know, most of the public just thought, yeah, yeah, SPCA in New Zealand and thought of it as one organization, but it was 46. So I started in January with Canterbury, knowing that the organization was trying to pull itself together to become one organization. But there are a few things that predecessors of mine had done that were really, really smart. And one in particular is Rona Booth. And at that time when I joined, she was the marketing and fundraising manager for SPCA Auckland and the marketing and fundraising manager for RNZ SPCA. And because prior to her taking both of those roles, we'd had a fundraising manager at RNZ SPCA who was trying to compete. You know, I mean, he, he had nowhere to go. It was, must have been incredibly challenging because every SPCA was going, no, you can't talk to that you know, community or that geograph geographic area because they're mine. So, you know, we were all competing with each other and it was, it was messy. Whereas when Rona came in, um, and, you know, Auckland was obviously the biggest, had the biggest program, already had regular giving in place and that kind of thing. She went, how about I take on the national job when the previous person had left? And that was a great opportunity because her team walked in there and took off their Auckland hats and went, wow, we've got a whole lot of opportunity across New Zealand. So she managed to convince the leadership of the organisation and the board in particular that we should do a national regular giving program and got investment committed into that. And so that was due to start in March of 2016. But the really tragic thing that also happened in March was that Rona was diagnosed with cancer and she died in August at the age of 46 and she left behind a really devastated team. And so Rona and I had already cooked up what we were gonna do long-term with the organization, you know, not known to anyone else, but the plan was that she was gonna have this role and I was gonna look after all the capital and major donor type fundraising. <laughs> so we'd organized that and, you know, best laid plans. Um, so after, after Rona passed away, um, the then CEO of SPCA Auckland met with me and asked, she seconded me in to take over the marketing and fundraising role for SPCA Auckland and for RNZ SPCA. So for well over a year there, I had three jobs, three budgets, three boards, different financial years. And I'd only ever managed one person in my career before. So it was, it was horrendous. And I was really lucky that we didn't really stuff up something terribly. But um, on 1 November 2017, the organisation did come together as one united entity. And, um, and I was really fortunate in that Andrea, the CEO, offered me the role of GM marketing and fundraising. So we had to bring multiple databases together, you know, 156 bank accounts, 26 websites, so many Facebook, <laughs> it was just nothing. So frankly, the last three years, have been focused on bringing consistent systems and processes into play, um, bringing, bringing, you know, re we've rebranded the organization because everybody had competing brands going on out there. Um, we just unified everything as well as putting the foot to the pedal on growing fundraised income. So we've significantly grown our donor base and our net, net fundraised income has been growing extraordinarily at the same time. So yeah, it's been nutty, but we have gone from, you know, sausage sizzles to a much more professional program that fits with an organization of our size. Oh, well, I hope sausage sizzles are still in there somewhere because... Uh, There's still we, people out there doing sausage sizzles, don't you worry. It, where would I go <laughs> for my Saturday morning tea? But what stands out as uh, one of your best success stories to be part of in your time at the SPCA and what went into making this this one a success? Um, 
so I thought about this one too. And, you know, there is nothing I enjoy more than writing a board report or a paper for the board and presenting it to them, showing our success and our overall success or on, you know, one part of our program. But in actual fact, I think the most vital and memorable stuff is some of those smaller, quieter moments that we have as fundraisers. And I was thinking of one in particular. And back when I was just fundraising manager for SPCA Canterbury, I used to see all the replies coming in for our direct mail pieces. And I remember one day, Shelby, my colleague, pointed out to me, she said, you have to read this one. And we quite often put bounce backs in our DM packs. And so we'd asked um, the donors to describe, you know, the, the story around one of their pets. And I got this one back from a man called James. And he told me about a little dashant who had been the love of his life. And I thought, I can't not ring a donor who tells me about a little dog that was the love of his life. So anyway, I ring James up and thank him for his gift and say, look, you know, you, you, it really prompted me to ring you. And so he started telling me the story of Kushla the Dachshund, who was the love of his life. And she'd had a spinal issue, which can happen with Dachshunds with their long spines. Um, and this happened on the weekend that the only specialist orthopedic vet in Christchurch was away at a conference. And so by the time he came back, it was too late to do any kind of remedial surgery on this little dog. And so for the next I think seven years or so, this little dog was paralyzed. And so James did everything for her, including he made this little carry thing so that he could still take her on her daily walk at the beach you know and I mean it was just we were both in tears anyway I invited him to come and visit us at the center and he brought his partner Colin and so I showed them around our center and you know we had this newly built vet clinic and we had an x-ray room in the vet clinic but no x-ray machine because we couldn't afford it and so you know I sort of said you know this is one of our projects coming up and you know we'd like to buy an x-ray machine and you know and, and so we had a lovely lovely time um and they went home and then they did come back with a significant gift toward the x-ray machine and it's it's those kinds of things it's those you know those human connection moments and that you know oh i love that stuff yeah, that's incredible. Another touching story, which is great. And and what what important lessons have you learned over the past few years when it comes to acquiring new donors? New donors. So we we we're, we're in a bit of an interesting position because SPCA is an old organisation. It started in eighteen seventy two um, in Christchurch. In fact, um, so it's old. It's well known, so our brand awareness level is really high. It's, it's got high trust levels we enjoy as well. But because we were those 46 separate entities, really the only place we were running a fundraising program like this was Auckland. So we hadn't done a lot of cold direct mail acquisition or face-to-face -face acquisition anywhere else because those smaller SPCAs had never been able to afford it. So coming together, I have now, you know, I've got all of New Zealand that's pretty green field for SPCA. You know, we haven't absolutely rinsed dry, um, you know, all those DM lists. So cold DM acquisition is still working for us. And I'm using that as a, um, an acquisition for our legacy program because legacy is particularly strong for SPCA. So we get extraordinary numbers of people who are coming in through cold acquisition telling us they've already left us a gift in their will or asking for information about leaving a gift in their will. Um, and our face-to-face -face recruitment and our telemarketing are all still performing really well. Whereas I know that, you know, cold acquisition DM acquisition is much harder for a lot of other organizations our age because they've been doing it for so long. So it's it's a bit of a unique and privileged position really for us. 
Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Usually it goes the other way when I ask that question. So very interesting to hear that. And and how important have corporate partner relationships been to your fundraising efforts? So I'm I'm of the view that you should have a small family of corporate partners that are really strong and committed relationships as opposed to, you know, scattering that far and wide. And I fully understand and appreciate why corporate partners, you know, they need to get value back out of that relationship, but it has to develop, uh, deliver to their business objectives. So that's good and fine. And I guess, so we've got a, a very small family of corporate partners, but they're really critical to us. And I guess I'd highlight the relationship we have with Nestle Purina. So they feed all the cats and dogs at SPCA. So they're, they're giving us 90,000 kilograms of pet food a year. Um, but they also support us um, with cash contribution and in so many other ways. But the re- it, it's the relationship that we have with them that's extraordinary. And it's, it's, a real, it's built up over the years and it's really strong and trusting. You know, um, I remember when we were filming a television series some years ago um, and our comms manager at the time was supervising the filming and then the the crew and the vets that were being filmed went away to have lunch and they forgot to tell her when they came back and recommenced filming and actually they put on film um, the euthanasia of a dog it was a very sick dog she had tumors all over but they filmed this euthanasia none of us had agreed to do that and Perina were actually sponsoring the TV show as well. So I was straight on the phone to them going, <laughs> and um, I got a call from their head of country who was visiting China at the time. And we all both, you know, were immediately putting um, crisis response comms plans into place <laughs> in case there was a, a very negative backlash. Fortunately for both of us, um, in actual fact, it was so beautifully and sensitively done and our vet was there with tears in her eyes and you know that actually we never got any negative feedback about it but you know we 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 have that very trusting relationship going on and they go above and beyond for us so they are always looking for opportunities to help our fundraising activities. So they're putting, you know, some promotion on in a supermarket, you know, one of the supermarket chains here, and they will go to them and ask them to make a contribution to SPCA or get us in for some fundraising activity, all of that kind of kind of thing. So they're just extraordinary. Oh, that's incredible. Are there any uh, tips for smaller organizations about how they could acquire such a great corporate partner relationship? Or is it just something that happens a bit more organically? Well, I mean, you know, there's obvious alignment between SPCA and Nestle Purina. You know, Pet Food, as we also have a corporate relationship with Southern Cross Pet Insurance, and the alignment there is very obvious. I think it, there's that difference between sponsorship and, and corporate giving where they're giving a gift just, you know, for the feel good factor and just so that they can showcase it to their customers that they've got good corporate social responsibility values going on. With Perina and certainly with us for Southern Cross, it is about growing their customer base. And, you know, and they are successfully doing that with this alignment. So it's, it's, it's very much getting that win win. I think that's much harder if you're a small you know, less well-known organization, but if you can help them build their customer base or whatever, then that's, that's sort of what, what they're looking for. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. And another area that you put a lot of emphasis on and it was something that uh, we really wanted to cover in this interview as well is uh, loving your donors. So what does SPCA do to nurture strong relationships with their donors? So I'd like to start by saying that we're not perfect at this yet. <laughs> And it's a journey. Um, so, but I think, I think it's about making sure that the whole team and frankly, the whole organization, and that's still a work in progress, but that the whole team, you know, that the culture is immersed about how important those donors are, 
you know, I love that saying that's out there, and I know that Mark Phillips at Blue Frog credited Chris Heron with it, but I've also seen Tom Ahern use it, so I'm not sure, 100% sure who it is, but it's the, she is not your donor, you are one of her charities, you know? And it's making sure that everybody in the organization understands that, and it, it is a privilege that this person wants to support us. I mean, I talk to, a, some of our, our donors, or they will write in and tell us, you know, they're giving up a cup of tea in a cafe every week, or a packet of chocolate biscuits every week so that they can help the animals. I, you know, we're just lucky to be the conduit in the middle that, you know, helps them help the animals. So it's, it's, I think it's about making sure that your whole team have the right attitude. And yes, we've all got budgets to meet and KPIs and all of that good stuff. But none of those will be successful unless you've got that donor focus at the heart of everything. Yeah, no, that's that's really well put. And where are you seeing other organizations missing the mark when it comes to this? So I'm frankly, I'd be a person in a glass house throwing stones if I commented on other organizations, because I know that we haven't got this 100% right out ourselves. But I think the, the critical thing um, is, is embedding that attitude right across your organization. And we haven't done that yet. So customer experience is one of my big, big upcoming projects because I know that, you know, people walk into SPCA centers across the country and have an absolutely wonderful customer experience, but getting that consistency and standardization of those kinds of things is still, you know, something we're working on having brought the organization together. So getting that whole of organization, you know, buy into to really value that person who brings us in a whole lot of old towels that they've had a clean out of the linen cupboard because you know, you don't know, but they could well be one of our major donors, a legacy donor, or just bringing us towels. And none of that matters. You know, we've just got to really love and value those people for going to that effort. I mean, during lockdown, you know, there were so many people knitting for us. So they were knitting blankets and knitting little toy mice um, for the cats to play with. And they knit little dog jumpers. You know, I've got this lovely lady on the North Shore in Auckland. And so every year she knits, she's in a rest home. She knits jumpers for the dogs and sends them to Christchurch because she figures they need them more than the Auckland ones do. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's so sweet. Um, and what, what systems or processes can fundraising teams put in place to create stronger relationships with their donors? So this is something that we've been looking at. And I guess one of the things you know, our donor base is older. And for some people, um, you know, giving cash gets more difficult as you get older. You know, um, but they still, you know, they've been giving for years, and they still want to stay connected to the organisation. So that's something that we've been focusing on and looking at a little bit um, lately and putting some systems and processes into place. Because you know, we all know that the major donor group and even the mid-level donor group have higher value touch points and all of that kind of thing from the organization because of the amount of money they're giving. But we wanted to also look at, you know, yes, but this person has been giving for 20 years and okay, they might only be able to send us $5, you know, a couple of times a year, but you can see their level of commitment. Um, and, and why shouldn't they receive some love and, you know, extra special touch points as well? So we've been looking at that. I mean, to be perfectly honest, you know, legacy giving to SPCA is extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. And it's, um, it's half our fundraised income. And we've never run a United Legacy program across this organisation. I mean, we do have a lot of thanks to give to Bob Kerridge, who was CEO of Auckland and very well known. And I'd say that his work back then has been a significant driver to legacy giving to SPCA, but we only launched SPCA's um, national legacy program the year before last. And we call that giving hearts. And so we are focused on growing that as well. But um, yeah, just, just making sure that we don't, 
miss miss some people off. And I guess just the last question along those lines was how has this processed or uh, the attention that you're giving your donors, how is that converting into regular givers? So those things are, weren't particularly focused on, on converting those people to regular givers, although the checks being um, no longer available from mid-year in New Zealand is going to be a problem for those people. Um, so we, we, we do, of course, offer them the opportunity to become a regular donor, but we offer them other opportunities. We're working on some other stuff for that in particular. But we, we do run our regular giving, uh, our cash program through our telemarketing so that we convert. We, we also try and convert adopters um, as well as, you know, the lead generation activity. But so the, the regular giving program is on a strong growth trajectory. But it is it is about, you know, regular giving isn't going to suit all of those cash donors. And I don't want them to feel that, you know, we're pushing it that hard for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we, we mentioned it early in the um, early on in the interview, but you also put a lot of emphasis on building a strong team. Um, what have you found goes into building a high performance fundraising team? Quite clever people. <laughs> um, yeah. I, it is. It's about hiring talented and clever people who know more than you do um, for me and, and then giving them all the tools that they need to do the job. So I see my job as um, I, my job is to have the faith of the we don't have a CFO. We have a general manager, finance and shared services and a CEO and the board. So my job is to get the resources that we need for the team to go and, you know, deliver the program. And I need to have the trust of those people and for them to see that the plans that we're putting in place, you know, make business sense um, and all of that good stuff and ensuring that they have the right tools to, to do the job well, you know. Um, and, and that takes investment and particularly these days with technology and, and, and all of that kind of, thing you know investing in marketing automation um tools and that kind of thing so that we can you know get smarter with our communications and personalize more and all of that good stuff so that's what i do and then i just go there you go <laughs> and they go off and do you know all the technical stuff with ubiquity that i don't know how to do <laughs> Uh, that's music to my ears. I was a digital fundraiser trying to get the tools I needed to execute my job. It uh, was quite difficult at times. But how can senior management be better at identifying and retaining talented fundraising staff? I think it's really basic, really. I mean, people want to feel valued and they want to feel like they're doing meaningful work. So, you know, and it's not always easy. I mean, last year, uh, we were doing our financial year runs July to June. So we were doing our budgets and we were still looking at them in May, June. And that's when everybody was predicting a major economic recession. And, you know, and I was slashing our income lines. I didn't slash any of our expenditure lines. Um, but um, actually I upped some of those, but um, I couldn't give anybody pay increases. You know, there was a determination made across the organization, no one would get a pay increase. And we were looking at a very big red number at the bottom of the budget. Um, and I also don't have much money for professional development. And I know that that's really important. And actually we ran just before lockdown in March last year. And one of the managers in my team, Vanessa, came up with this brilliant idea because I've now got a team of 35, which is quite a big team. And so, you know, to try and send them all to a conference or something is really hard um, and expensive. So she came up with an idea of why don't we create our own mini conference? And so we did that. And um, so we just reached out to all the people that we know um, and asked for them for support for free. So ASB gave us um, a room in the cube down at the Viaduct waterfront in Auckland for a day. And then KPMG gave us their high tech room um, the following day. And so we got people like, I reached out to Karen Walker for people, you know, who may not know Karen Walker. She's an internationally renowned um, fashion designer. 
she's an ambassador of ours and an animal lover. So I asked her if she would open our conference and do the first plenary session type of thing, which she did. You know, I was so scared asking. <laughs> she said, no, absolutely went away, and wrote it in her diary straight away. <laughs> Um, and, you know, and talked about the development of her whole brand and all of that sort of thing. And then we got our brand agency and their head came in and talked about the brand development. And then I reached out to Natalie Davis, who um, was head of fundraising um, at the time at St. John. Um, she still does um, all their brand marketing and customer experience stuff. And she came and talked to us about, you know, what it's like in their organization. KPMG did a session on artificial intelligence. We got a donor panel in and got them, you know, our people just talking to a whole group of our donors and having a conversation, which was fantastic. So, and so, you know, really all I paid for was travel for the people who weren't based in Auckland and overnight accommodation and the rest was free. So I think if you can get imaginative about what you can do to really show your people that you value them and, and that they're doing great work is a good thing. Wow, that's incredible. It sounds very innovative of you. And um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know how I know who Karen Walker is, but I do. It must be because I'm married to a fashion enthusiast. But um, and I think we're getting a bit of an idea of it. And, um, you know, we have touched on it a bit. But what is your leadership style like? And why do you think it's effective? Um, well, I, it, it isn't always. Um, and I'm still learning in that space. So I because I, you know, there's, I've got this issue that I'm trying to resolve in my team. And I was talking to my CEO, who I, she is an amazing leader. And, you know, because I hadn't managed people before this job, you know, <laughs> I still feel like I'm a real novice in this space. And I, I had a coaching session with somebody last week, and I've got another one booked next week <laughs> to help me get better. But my approach is, um, I believe in that whole servant leadership model. So I'm there to serve my people and to make sure that they have what they need to do the job. And so, you know, always available, you know, open door, whatever, whatever they need kind of, kind of is what I want to do. But there's still, there's still a lot of learning for me in this space. There's still, still room to grow. Uh, I think it's always a hard one to sort of answer a question about yourself like that. But um, for fundraisers starting their career, what advice can you give them to ensure that they have a successful career? So I think um, there's the usual stuff of, you know, working hard <laughs> and all of that good stuff. But I hire for attitude, you know. I'll hire the, right, the person with the right attitude and that will fit well with the team and we can teach some skills, you know, if that's not quite quite there. And I think if you're the junior fundraiser and you're thinking about a long career in this in this field, then look wider. I think I think you know. Yes, you've got your own job, and yes, you need to be proficient at it. But get a better understanding of the whole ecosystem of the organisation, you know, and understand all the interplay of that. Um, so that you you understand and actually then can make better judgments about what you're proposing should be done or you know you can see more opportunities um, all of that kind of stuff i think too that people should read a lot um, and you know so much of it's so easily digestible and available online now you know and you get your daily agitator blog post and you you know subscribe to all of those good things Definitely read Sophie, um, which is the showcase of fundraising innovation um, that comes out of the UK that Ken Burnett started, who's my favourite fundraiser in all the world. I just have to say that. He knows that already anyway. But I mean, Sophie has wonderful case studies and examples of work that people have done and it's all there for free and, you know, you can borrow from it. So, you know, make sure that you build your knowledge base. And I think um, build networks with other fundraisers, you know, create little benchmarking groups where you get together every now and then and talk about all your successes and your failures, you know, really important to talk about your failures. I remember the first DM I ever sent and it was for Coast Guard. And um, I got some advice, but it, 
and it, it looked pretty, you know, I worked with an agency and it looked glorious and I thought, oh, this is going to be marvelous and sent it out. And actually it didn't perform terribly well. So I reached out to a whole lot of people I didn't know, like, you know, the person who was, look, Aaron Peacock, he's now with Cancer in Auckland, but I reached out to him at Oxfam because I loved their DMs. And I sent it to him and I said, would you please critique this for me? I sent it to, um, I might've been Shane Chisholm at Salvation Army at that time. I just sent it to all these people I didn't know and asked for them to come back and tell me where I'd gone wrong. And, and they did. And, you know, and Aaron kept critiquing DMs for me after that and helping, you know, it was wonderful. It was amazing. So, you know, do that kind of thing and just be completely open to learning um, and only do this job if you love it. Yeah. That's great advice. That really is. And um, you've served on nonprofit boards in the past. And what goes into creating a high quality board, which benefits the organization's fundraising efforts, do you think? Fundraising, yeah. And it's uh, fundraising of boards is a really interesting place. <laughs> so, you know, whenever I have been on a board, it is because I, I understand a bit about fundraising. But um, getting boards involved in fundraising is really challenging in this country. Um, uh, you know, when I was talking about those fabulous people at Nestle, Perina, they did um, pay for my CEO and I to go on a trip to the States to see their setup over there. But they gave us some extra days so that we could meet with SPCAs in the, in the US. And we spent two days with the CEO of the Houston SPCA. Now, Texas, a lot of money in Texas. <laughs> and I mean, you know, she was telling us, I think her board, you know, they fundraise themselves. So either them giving or them getting donations and, uh, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 million every year. Um, and that isn't how it works in New Zealand. And often people talk about, oh, you know, the give, get or get off kind of American methodology. But I was on a board here in Christchurch for an arts organisation where we did have a policy there that the board were required to give, you know, to give themselves. And I think that's absolutely critical. I think all New Zealand non-profit boards, um, if you're going to be a board member, you should give it a, at a value that's meaningful for you. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a dollar value because, you know, people have differing abilities to give at different stages of their life. So give in a way that's meaningful. Um, and I think, um, you know, it's, I guess it's like I was saying, my job is um, generally, but boards need to empower their fundraisers to succeed. And sometimes I know that occasionally a fundraiser will get me to, you know, would you come and talk to my board <laughs> and basically, you know, get them to get real about fundraising if I'm really, really honest. And they might want to have, I don't know, you know, rather glamorous gala type events. And I might talk to them about actually that might not be your best investment. <laughs> and actually investing in another type of fundraising would actually deliver you better long term results. Yeah, no, that's that's very interesting insight. And um, how have you seen the CEO uh, either positively or negatively impact fundraising efforts? And what can you share as advice to CEOs to help them uh, help their fundraising team? So I've got the most spectacular CEO in the world, Andrea Midgen. Um, and she, I guess she's one of those people who, who trusts that her, that her team and whatever function we're talking about, but for marketing fundraising, that we know what we're talking about. And, you know, and we back that up by proving it to her with the results. So, you know, where I've worked with CEOs before and perhaps they've, you know, wanted to have some editorial input on a direct mail piece. Andrea will never, ever do that to me. She will not, she will go, your team know how those should be structured to succeed for fundraising. So I'm not going to mess in there in areas that I don't know about. And I think that's, that's really critical. It, it is critical that you've built that trust that I talked about before. So you've, you've proved to them that you know what you're doing. Um, but they also have to give you the ability to go and do those things. And I mean, even, you know, we've got a, a beautiful direct mail piece out at the moment for our annual appeal. It's our first one of the year. And we're taking a risk with it. So we've completely changed our format. It's a five page, you know, long form, no photographs, which we would normally have in our DM. 
And it's the story of a dog that we rescued that was fostered by one of our staff members. It was a horrendous case of neglect, like the pictures are disgusting. Um, but we haven't, we've only included one before photo in the DM pack. Um, and we euthanized that dog in the end. Now I've never, we've never done that before and it's a risk. I think that Jess, who's in my team, has done such a beautiful job along with Abby, who's our designer. And basically what we're showcasing is, and we've done a scrapbook type thing of all these beautiful photographs of this little dog in foster care with Rachel, our staff member. And you know, this little dog sitting up on the couch reading storybooks with her children. You know, this little dog with her mother-in-law, she's giving it a treat. And you know, it's first and only ever trip to the beach and how they took it and bought it an ice cream on the way home. And this little dog having the most joyous, albeit a short period of its life and living the life that a well-loved dog should live. But we do finish it with the euthanasia and I don't know how that's going to go, to be honest. <laughs> so, you know, you need to see, and, I, and I've told Andrea, our CEO, all of this, and she went, if you don't try anything, you'll, you'll never know. I, you know, she's right behind us and giving us the ability to try, try things. And I might have to check in to see how that uh, campaign performs, that DM appeals. It's a very interesting approach and it's always interesting trying something out of the norm. So so as the world currently battles the pandemic at the moment, what are some of the challenges that nonprofit organisations face at these times? I think it depends on what your fundraising programme was made up of. I mean, I know... Do darn well how fortunate we are in New Zealand and it's way different um, for a whole lot of other organisations. Uh, one of our previous fundraising manager is English and she's back in the UK and works for Alzheimer's UK and you know is partially furloughed and all of that sort of stuff and that it's really challenging in other places. I think for here I think the pandemic reinforces the importance of having a really diverse programme um, those organisations that are wholly reliant on event fundraising, for example, will be finding it much more challenging um, at the moment. So I think it's it's that importance of being able to to you know ramp up and pull back. You know, we we I had a, a community and events team of four last year um, when we went into the pandemic, and as part of our cost saving measures, I did have to restructure that team. Fortunately, I was able to keep everybody's job. Um, but, you know, we pulled back on our event fundraising. Um, we, we were actually really fortunate just with timings. We had just run our annual street collection um, early in March, so pre going into lockdown. And we did reschedule our other events. One went extraordinarily well. We, this was really fortunate. It's a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising event called Jump to the Rescue, where you parachute out of a plane. And um, you have your friends, colleagues, family all sponsor you to do so. We timed that just as we came out of lockdown. So, and themed it break free. It did the best it's ever done. That really resonated with people. But then, you know, we'd had to postpone Cupcake Day and um, that didn't do anywhere near as well as the, the year before. And we weren't shocked or surprised by that. So. So being able to sort of do that whole pivoty thing, we, we did an emergency campaign um, and we moved really fast on that. I had my management team meeting daily straight after our senior leadership team met. So we went hard in the lead up to lockdown with comms um, because we needed to get as many animals out in foster care and adopted as we possibly could. It was extraordinary. <laughs> like, the day before lockdown, we had 200 people lined up outside the Christchurch Centre it ended in fisticuffs and us having to call the police over kittens. <laughs> it, was just, it was mad. But anyway, we went and, and so once, once we were in lockdown, we then went straight into fundraising mode. Um, and donor care was really important. So, you know, the people that couldn't be out doing the normal components of their job, we had them reaching out to donors, checking in with them. Um, we got a DM out really quickly, but with soft asks. So we started by asking people to knit and do those things. And we purposefully put no reply device in, in that pack. We said, we do not want you leaving home and going to the post office to send us a gift. 
if you can do it in these other ways, either by phone or online, then that would be lovely. Otherwise, wait. Um, and that performed extraordinarily well. So I think you, you, need, you need to be nimble. You need to, you know, be talking to each other and thinking about what your program needs to look like. You know, we called immediate meetings on Monday um, of this week when Auckland went back into level three to go, okay, what do we need to do? What should we be doing? You know, what's important? What will our donors need from us? All of that good stuff. Yeah, great. It sounds like you've adapted really well to the um, to these tough times, which is always difficult. And, and as I said in the introduction, you've been involved in fundraising now for over 20 years. What are you hoping to achieve in the next five to 10 years? So it's fun. I'm currently working on our five-year strategy at the moment. Um, and with SPCA, we still have the opportunity to grow our regular giving and our cash programs and our legacy programs. So all those traditional things, which we will continue. I'm focused on growth of those. But we also need, whilst we've been doing digital fundraising for, for some years now, and it is growing significantly, we need a much more comprehensive strategy around that. So that's, that's a bit of a, a focus for us. But I guess my personal goal is to really get SPCA's program humming. Um, you know, just bringing, like we brought four Razor's Edge databases together and you know, that'll been set up differently and all of that, you know, nightmarish type scenario. So that team have been working on, you know, just getting that all sorted and cleaning the data and all of that good stuff. So. You know, it's only been in probably the last past 12 months we've been getting good reporting and good analysis out of that. Um, but, you know, we've now got those good Power BI tools that really help and form, form our strategy. So we really want to get that working well. And then my personal goal is to, to get that going. And then actually what I want to do is go and work with legacy donors somewhere because... Um, you know that's the most amazing gift anyone can give is a gift in their will and i don't get to work with donors enough i i take all our difficult complaints and that's my connection to our donors but um and i talk to them so but i i i miss some of that joy of that really direct connection so that's my personal plan <laughs> Oh, it sounds great. And it sounds like you're doing really great work and that the SPCA in New Zealand is doing well, uh, considering these tough times. So well done to you and your team. And we are down to the final question. But I just want to say, Dominique, thank you so much for coming on for Phil today. Uh, thank you, Jake. I really enjoyed it. As I said to you earlier, I can talk about fundraising all day long. <laughs> Oh, it's great. Those are the, that, that's the people I want to get on fulfilled who absolutely enjoy it. And you can actually, uh, you can see it shines through on you, which is great. But what's your final piece of advice to inspire and fulfill fundraisers to make a positive impact and create change for a better world? So I, um, I think be willing to be vulnerable, be willing to own what you don't know and look for those learning opportunities and ask other people to help you. I mean, there's nothing more, um, you know, that will make people feel better than being asked to help somebody else, you know? And so do those things. And if you love, love your job, you will be a success at it. 